Greetings, everyone. Welcome back to the next installment of Seligia Cast. Uh, we have uh, some good and bad news to share with you all. But uh, as you know, we really haven't been getting enough information from CCP pretty much at all in the uh, in you know in, in the while it's been taking them to put out information. They really haven't been putting out any information at all because there is a info lock that they put up. But anyway, uh, first I'd like to introduce or let let our guest introduce himself uh so tell us who you are and uh your relationship to seligia well i go by chaos mostly on the internet but in seligia i'm my character's name is damien drake uh, i found you guys through the podcast uh, i was looking around on the internet for world of darkness information and happened to cross the video titled, uh, 10 Things You Should Know About, uh, World of Darkness, or 10 Reasons You Should Be Interested, that's what it was, yeah. And then, uh, I dug, dug even further in and found, uh, the forums and been here ever since. Great, awesome. Do you have any, uh, hopes for the game before we go any further into the podcast? Mm, my biggest hope is that the game is, uh, as open as possible. I'd like just full out sandbox game. Do whatever you want to do. Great. Well, then you'll be pretty happy with uh, our information for the podcast. But anyway, uh, uh, I'll let uh, our other two lovely panel members introduce themselves. Hello, I am Guy. Hello, I'm Eve. Uh, so with that all squared away, we can start. As I said before, we have some good and bad news. I think starting with the good news would be best, uh, since, you know, bad news needs to be remembered. Or, in this case, it needs to be remembered. Uh, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, I'll stop being so shady and get right into it. Not so recently, there was an interview with David Reed, who is CCP's chief marketing officer, uh, which was administered by an interview at tentonhammer.com, which I'll uh, give a link to the, uh, to the site in the description below. I won't go through the whole interview, but I will bring up the big points. David said that the game was, quote, is absolutely leaning towards the sandbox side. Uh, this really excites me. It's uh, what I was wishing uh, for in the previous podcast, if you guys remember it or even watched it. I mean, there isn't much to go off of, but it's definitely a start. Let me hear what you guys think about that quote. Uh, the sandbox, that excites me to no end, because as I've said before, I love the lone world of darkness, I love the open world, the wide world, there are all these crazy things in it. And to go around and either to find them or most likely be killed by them excites me. I like to be able to go out and let's see what's here, what's there. You know, Virgil, from experience that in SOTOR I would drag you off the path of the mission to go click on a button to get a freaking lore object. So if it's an open world and I get to explore that world, that excites me to know and I really like the sound of that. Um, I actually like the sound of it too. I mean, most sandbox games are pretty fun, but generally they're single player and they have maybe a co-op option with it, so it's going to be interesting to see a sandbox game done in an MMO style in the world of darkness, so I'm really excited about it as well. I, uh, like I said earlier, was hoping it would be sandbox also, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it because uh, I like the sound of just being able to do whatever you want. If you don't want to do quests or something, you just go roaming around exploring and finding things. It sounds really awesome. Okay, very good. Then he, this is the second part of the of the interview that I, I think needs to be brought up. And he went, to, he went on to say, uh, quote, World of Darkness is a scary place. There are things out there you just shouldn't be messing with, no matter how badass you think you are. Uh, now, it was said that that was the end of the quote. Now he's now it was said he went on to talk about how PVE content would be avoidance based ju as much as combative based. So it is to my understanding that you'll be having to use different you'll be having to use a different approach for a certain situation. Um, and I also think this might be uh, for political aspects of the game because we know those are going to be in it and combative and all these different approaches that can be done in the game. Um, as I said, as I said, it could be even perhaps even looking for enemies' weak points uh, before going out on a full assault. 
by, it was even said by David Reed that no matter how many friends you bring, it may not even be enough to get past an enemy or an obstacle. So let me hear what you guys have to think or if you have to add anything from the interview. Well, I like the sound of that for many reasons. Um, for one, to just use the old example that I, I think I might have used before, um, from the secret world, when you're walking up this road and you see this police car that's been destroyed to hell and just painted with blood, if you were playing that, you go, all right, let's go find out what did this to the police car and killed everybody inside. Perhaps in the world of darkness, since there are some things that you don't want to fight in a small area with, you say, you know what, let's not find out what did that and carry on. Which, to me, makes a lot more sense, because this isn't D&D, &D, this isn't Neverwinter Nights, this isn't Guild Wars 2. You, you're not going to go around killing everything and stealing all their stuff. Uh, World of Darkness, the tabletop, and hopefully this, will be much more of a social game. Which means you might want to avoid things more than fight them. Especially given the nature of the masquerade, which is no one's supposed to know you're a vampire, no one's supposed to know you're a mythical creature, you don't want to be fighting out in the open and using these abilities in the open. So it does make a lot more sense that it isn't your standard PvE one group of enemies to another group of enemies that we've said before. Um, I agree with Gaius a lot about that all, and I think it's really cool that they're going to put in like enemies and stuff, or just situations where you want to avoid it at all costs because there's, you know, it's just safer to do so. And I think that makes for a much more enriching and fun gaming experience. I think all these games that, like World of Warcraft, you're level 90 and you're just basically the top badass, it's, it gets boring. Who wants to be, you know, the top badass all the time? I think it's really interesting and I think it's going to work out well for them what they're doing. I am very interested in this. Um, I like the idea that you don't have to just throw bodies at it to get it done and, and there are other options out there. Not every character will be a combat based character so you have other options which is really good. So I, w I really like the sound of this. Yeah, very good. I, I definitely agree with all, all your guys' uh, points. Um, now. I'll just move into the next uh, next point, which is the last point that was made, and it was about player content creation. And we talked about it, I, and I think it was the, our t our 10 reasons to be interested, that there was going to be player content, and I'm glad because this kind of enforces that uh, statement that was said. And I'll read you a quote, uh, and I'll let, it speak for, I'll let it speak for itself. Here's the quote. There are things we are doing that will reward players for creating content as it is consumed by other players. It's something that we think can happen not just in the game itself, but also on the web, on mobile devices, and things like that. How you participate in the World of Darkness universe are creating things that other people are consuming. Whether it's an item, or whether it's in items, the game, wait, sorry, whether it's items in the game, whether it's stories that they're reading, tips, and things like that. And by this we can assume we will be getting some type of tool in the game which will be used for players to create their own stuff, which really excites me because, again, it enforces that statement that we said way back when. Uh, so what do you guys think about this, perhaps, tool that we can use to create content? I have actually two points, um, two completely separate points. And I'm just going to springboard off of what you're saying about creating. We've mentioned creating stuff in the past. And actually, in our Wishlist podcast on YouTube, um, this post was made three weeks ago by a French user who, I'm sorry, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce your username. Hopefully, you, if you're listening, you know who you are. Who said that he would hope that uh, item creation is limited to occult items or stuff like that for blood rituals and thermocurgy and stuff like that. While I'm not, I don't necessarily disagree with that, or rather agree with that, I'm sorry. While I don't necessarily agree with that, I think you should get a wider range of stuff to create. It is an interesting idea of putting together your own occult and magical items. I just wanted to give him a shout out. You said you wanted to join the guild, so I'm going to give you that and hopefully he'll end up in the guild. Aside from actually creating physical items in game, there is the stuff about unmobile items on the on online. That screams player content outside of the game, as you said. Guild, perhaps in-character uh, blogs like Tumblr, in-character Facebook pages, in-character Twitters. And that makes a lot of sense. Because what I, I heard a story 
not long ago. It was the gentleman gamer who was part of the YouTube RPG Brigade talk about how he ran a World of the Darkness game where he created, I think it was a blog or something like that, for one of his characters or one of the main characters in the story and his players can interact with that blog or with stuff like that outside or away from the table. And if there was stuff like that in-game, such as a guild RPG forum, where players can do something on a forum and then take knowledge or whatever into an RP situation in-game, that seems like what they're talking about here, and that excites me to an incredible degree. Uh, to me, my view on mods is that uh, mods or player-created content in general is uh, the lifeblood of most games. Uh, if you can keep creating content for a game, it will live forever. And uh, if you have players being able to do that, that's even better because then there are some ideas that even the developers won't think of. And um, I really like the idea of this because uh, I have been starting to learn programming myself and hopefully I uh, will be able to participate in this creation of some kind. Yeah, you actually brought up uh, something I was wondering and it was a uh, uh, about like kind of like a storyteller's perspective on creating content. So say, I know Neverwinter did something like this where a storyteller, well not a storyteller, but somebody could just make like a level design and people can go through that and play it. Now I'm wondering if, I think, and I think this was said within, um, in the interview that they were doing something like this where people can make their own levels or, or, or something like that in, in, in a similar fashion. And uh, I think that would be really interesting, maybe even give people the option to just roll, like say their strength is uh, five. Uh, it would be cool, like if you can, like, this, like if somebody was like storytelling something, you could be like, okay, roll a five here, and if you, you get that, your character maybe lifts up something or punches something. I don't know, just that could be really interesting. I think. Well, I don't know if you're talking about missions, uh, player created missions, because it's been said in the interview that it's not going to do the city of heroes style thing. But I do sort of see where you're coming from, and it doesn't make a lot of sense to creating things or having storytellers or moderators or whoever's going to have this role in game do that. And it'll be very interesting. Um, but I was just thinking, and this was in a, something we're going to talk about later, but the developers of EVE Online and thus CCP Gaming loved in EVE Online how things would happen. War, um, trade agreements and wars would occur without their involvement at all, um, which shows that they're even have a sort of emotional investment or social investment in a ship in a game about blowing ships up and mining crap. So suddenly to give them this uh, player created content in a social game excites me even more. Because if they can get you emotionally invested in starships, they should definitely get you emotionally invested in a game about actual people. Very good. Uh, Eve, what are your thoughts on this whole thing? Um, I think it's really cool that they're going to allow player content. I think that it will give a lot of people an opportunity. And if they have the same kind of economic system as EVE does, then, you know, maybe people will be able to make their own in-game money and all that stuff and be able to profit from playing the game, which would be really cool. I have a question for you guys. It just came to mind. If you could create something in the game, what would you create? What May it be items, clothing, uh levels like what would you guys create guy give me give me what you think what would i create what wouldn't i create that's a better question i know one of our members has been waiting for me to give him a silver magical sword for a couple of weeks but given what i would create given the wide setting i don't know what i'd create the possibilities are limitless uh, i'll come back around and maybe i'll think of something but right now i can't there's too many possibilities I would probably really enjoy creating clothing and stuff, but I don't know if that's a possibility yet. They haven't really talked much about it, but if I could create my own clothing, I would. Depending on what our options are for creation, I'm, I'm sure I'll pr probably try to create some kind of mobile application for the game with the programming that I've learned. And in-game, I'll probably try creating some kind of magical item or something, maybe clothing, uh, decorations for housing, something. I don't know. I'll figure it out. 
uh, I have something. Given the nature of my character, Gaius, um, being an academic, being a scholar, spe specifically in the occult, I would be interested in seeing if I can make tomes, books, scrolls, or have him write something and put that into the game or give it to a player. Because ever since I started in MMOs, going back to hell, going back to RuneScape, I would collect every book, every piece of paper that had writing on it, just to have it, just to have that bit of lore. So if I can contribute to that, of course, with canon materials, I'm not going to make stuff up as I go along. But it would be very interesting, at, at least in the guild setting. So I could say, here, I wrote this, take this, go do this, whatever. I'd be interested if I could write little books or notes and stuff. Yeah, I think that'd be a really cool, uh, really cool idea if you did something like that. And I, I, I think that would be pretty easily done. I mean, you know, you just write something and then put it in your inventory and then you can give it to somebody else. So, I mean, that's a pretty good idea. Um, so anyway, with that, we'll move on to the bad news. So, the bad news. I will let uh, our fearless, or my fearless co-person, the, <laughs> the bad news. He'll tell you all about it, because it's actually kind of hurtful to talk about. So I'll let him do that. Since one of my fearless. But anyway, I'm going to talk about something that seems to plague a lot of MMO development companies. Um, but usually it happens after the launch. Like it's, it's the layoffs. It's the CCP layoffs that occurred in December, early December. Um, according to, again, TomTomHammer.com, there were 15 positions that were wiped, that were eliminated from the World of Darkness team as part of a quote-unquote strategic adjustment. Um, sounds like a euphemism for something much worse. But, but then it said they remain committed to the project and they want to have a quote-unquote compelling, rich, and deep World of Darkness experience. And of course, they send the best witches to those who were sent off. Um, this seems to happen a lot. I believe after uh, Terra launched, there was the lawsuit. After Guild Wars 2 launched, there were layoffs. And then after SOTOR launched, there were Bioware layoffs. But I'm not familiar with a lot of layoffs that occurred before that really hit the development. I'm sure once I've said that, the comments are going to flip. Like, you idiot, you forgot this. But I am curious to how this would affect the project, because while there are quote-unquote strategic adjustments, that's 15 positions. I honestly do not have a scope of reference, really, for how many quote-unquote positions there are on a development team for an MMO, but 15 seems like a pretty wide number to eliminate and then have to allot their jobs to other people. So it seems more like a financial thing, but I don't know. What do you think? What do you guys think? Well, yeah, of course, uh, it's always bad to hear when this when this happens, especially when I have spo uh, spoken with a few of the people who have been laid off of Twitter, and you know, it's always sad to see them you go, and you know, it's definitely it's definitely not a good thing. But yeah, I don't I don't know I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing for the game for game wise. Um, I guess we'll just have to see. Um, the layoffs actually concern me because isn't this their, I think this is their second round of layoffs with this game before they even really have anything significantly done with it. I mean, it hasn't even launched yet. This game got announced back, what, like 2009 or something when they first said they were really working on it early steps. But it's been so long now and it just seems like they have barely anything really going on, but it at the same time they're not really sharing much with us which is probably why I'm thinking this but laying off people and already kind of a small team of people when EA has like giant teams of people to work on games which is why they just like shit out games every other month CCP doesn't have a whole team of gigantic team of people working on this game so I'm worried about in the long run does this mean it's going to take even longer before we get any new news or even longer before any word of a launch I, I'm gonna try and play devil's advocate here. Um, I'm really sad that the layoffs happened and all, and especially right before the holidays. But I'm really hoping also that the the team that's left will be more focused and and we'll we'll get a better game out of this. Um, I, again, I I really don't like layoffs in any game development studio, but. Uh, Hopefully it's for the better. Um, well, you have to assume it is for the best. Um, I mean, CCP, I think, is the only company with EVE Online that has 10 
years of near constant growth. So I don't think they're going to shoot themselves, or rather, I don't think they want to shoot themselves in the foot, of course. But before the layoffs, we did podcasts talking about there was the announcement trailer or that sneak peek or that we got with the running on the roof. Um, and how the clothes looked and how people were. I'm just curious if any of that will suffer. Like they said, they hired like fashion consultants or design consultants. How many of those were part of those 15 positions that were eliminated? So I'm trying to think if it's a strategic readjustment, not every game has a fashion designer or a fashion consultant. So was that eliminated? Was that, was that job done with? Or is there just going to lot that over to some other designer? So I'm thinking of the small things that could be jeopardized. The things that they said were going to be good. And then maybe they're sort of shying away from now that the money. But I mean, we're, three, we're two, probably three years away, probably more. I only, we're probably not even going to see the repercussions of these uh, layoffs in the final game, but I'm just curious about how things are going to end up or how things might change because of these 15 positions. Gone. Yeah, it's, uh, again, it's definitely sad to see that happen, and I hope, like, it, it doesn't jeopardize, as you said, I hope it doesn't jeopardize uh, the game in any fashion. If anything, I really hope it does uh, make it better. All right, now on the heels of very sad and unfortunate news, we're going to talk about the speech or the presentation given by the CEO of CCP Games, Himmler Vigar Peterson, at the DICE Summit 2013 in Europe. He gave a presentation which he called The Human Brain is the Platform, and it was put up by Variety on YouTube on November 7th. And I just wanted to talk about this pretty briefly, and Cass is going to talk about it with me. And I just hope here, let's give it off to Cass. Let's give Cass something to talk about. The demonstration that uh, Himmler gave was uh, pretty interesting. It was uh, mostly about his um, feelings that he went through when he was actually got to play Eve um, instead of designing and building Eve. And at first when he... Uh, was playing, he wanted to change everything. He thought it was all broken, and but then he joined a group of people and saw how they were playing it, and he thought they were playing it wrong, and then he figured out, hey, this is actually working. People are working together and doing things, and so he um, changed his view on how it worked, and, and it was a really interesting uh, discussion. I, I liked it. Just to clarify to the people listening, this presentation, there was nothing said about World of Darkness here at all. Um, nothing. So, if you have, if you don't care about listening to the, C, the CEO talk about Eve and his viewpoint, then I, I encourage you to watch it regardless. But the point I really liked about it, the point he made, was how emotionally invested he got in the game. He mentioned at one point a short story. Where he, I think he, I'm trying to remember, either he borrowed a friend's ship or something like that. I, I haven't played the online, so I'm not really sure how that would work. And he sent it out into space, and either he blew it up or it broke or something like that, and they had to leave. And they spent hours after developing the game mining and trying to pay back this debt. The creator of the game, now obsessed with trying to pay back this imaginary debt, and how invested emotionally he got into this game over not only an inanimate object, a pretend imaginary object that he blew up in imaginary space. So I just th that really t showed me the view that CCP Games and the CEO in general had of how emotionally invested players should be in the game. He, and he kept referring to the games as a, as a logical platform, or a logical construct, rather, and how CCP Games and their goal was to inject emotion into something that's just logic and numbers. And it is really interesting, especially when thinking about the future in World of Darkness. Uh, yes, uh, to clarify more on that uh, short story of his, it was, uh, he had a frigate and he wanted to borrow the Star Cruiser or some other ship he, to, from a friend to mine more efficiently for the group. And um, he accidentally ejected his pod from the ship while uh, plotting his autopilot route and uh, so
so he lost the ship and then yes he tried to um, instead of just recreating a new ship to give to him through his magical uh, developer powers he invested so much time to actually try and buy back the ship for his friend and that boys and girls is the actual explanation you get when you don't leave your notes on the video in another state um, but going on from that Later on, not much later on, it's only a 30 minute video, 35 minute video, he starts talking about the content and what the players were creating independent of the intention. He told a story that, you know, they had this, the, the, the galaxy or the sector or whatever divided up because of how people would invite their own friends from their own country and their own town, began becoming divided up regionally and among nations. And there was this huge chunk of Russian space sitting next to, if I remember correctly, Scandinavian space. They're much smaller than the Russian space. And the Russians, more organized, I believe they broke the game where they set up their own, because Russian, apparently the game wasn't translated into Russian, so they did their own little thing where they found a way to talk to themselves in Russian, but everyone else would just see random digits and numbers and shapes. So, and they kept attacking Scandinavian space, but they couldn't break through. I mean, they had their own code language, they had numbers and organization, and they couldn't, and they would figure out that it was, um, I believe it was the United States or North America, which is up higher, setting up secret supply lines to keep the Scandinavians alive, essentially. And it was all player generated, everything there. And it was, it was just brilliant, especially, again, thinking about a single server, if you were to divide World of Darkness up as a single server, as a single sort of galaxy in itself, cut everything up regionally as it's going to end up, because I really doubt someone who speaks English is going to RP with people who speak Japanese just due to the language gap, and just sort of think about how different RP groups and different communities and different guilds and different covens or whatever, if you want to use the uh, Requiem uh, terminology, would sort of help each other stay alive, how an RP community might keep other RP communities alive when they're being attacked by a purely PvP group, or something like that. It, it's really interesting to watch how uh, a, a sandbox um, free flow game uh, slowly settles and, and you see how things divide and, and take shape and stuff. I, I really like it. Yeah, it was a very... I, I hope to see more of him. If this was DICE uh, 2013, I'm looking forward to him or another CCP developer being there at DICE uh, 2014, 2015 until the games come out. And if we keep getting videos like this, we'll continue to report on them. Yeah. Well, from that story, I mean, it really seems like uh, World of Darkness is in the right hands. I mean, the fact that the guy went through all the time, well, the dev went through all the time to repay his friend in game just, you know, shows that they're good guys. <laughs> As I, I think I mentioned this earlier in the podcast, when they injected emotion, or the idea of emotion, into stuff that was inanimate, a starship, a, a mining planet, a frigate, and now taking that viewpoint of how games should be played and putting it into a social game, into a tabletop game, it really, I can't wait. Yeah, it's definitely going to be amazing. Uh, Eve, do you have anything to say about the video, or... Um, any no. thoughts on the story? No, no, okay. <laughs> um, well, pretty much, yeah. I'm definitely, I'm definitely happy to see that uh, the game is in CCP's hands. So yeah, with that little sweet story out of the way, we can go into another sweet story, and uh, it's about Eve's uh, channel and if you or YouTube channel. And if you're watching uh, the podcast right now, you'll probably be seeing the the videos that she has playing for our podcast. Um, from her YouTube channel, so I'll have Eve talk about her channel, and I'll also add the link to her the, the, to the website, or not the website, to the uh, domain uh, down in the description. So Eve, go ahead. Um, uh, I do Let's Plays of horror and survival games mostly, but also RPGs. I am doing a Let's Play of Vampire the Masquerade right now, so if anyone feels like going down memory lane, or if they haven't played it and watching a video about it, um, you can check out my channel. There should be a link in the description, as Virgil said. And I hope that and anyone who does look at it likes what they see. Yeah, so you should all go see it. It's uh, it's awesome. 
if you like watching Let's Plays, it's a, definitely an awesome place to go, and, you know, we can always use more views everywhere, so. I, I've watched quite a few of Eve's Let's Play videos, and I do enjoy them, and I do recommend that you watch, not just her Bloodlines one, but she does, I think, um, Alice, uh, Alice Returns, I watch a little bit of that, it's very, watch it, that's basically what I'm telling you to do, watch them now. Uh, Eve, do you have anything else to say about your channel? Um, no, I uh, just thank you very much, guys. Uh, you flattered me. Also, yeah, go subscribe to her channel and subscribe to my channel while you're at it. <laughs> okay, with that out of the way, we can go into a uh, more personal uh, area for everybody that is in a panel right now, which is the guild we are all in, which is Seligia. Um and, uh, yeah, what is, what is, we always talk about it in our podcast. If you want to check it out, you can always click on the description below and get the link there to our forums. And well, We're an RP guild. Um, if you've watched any of the uh, previous podcasts, you'll see we have a lot of stuff uh, about our guild. Um, but, yeah, I just want to, like, wanna, you know, give an update to what we've been doing and stuff like that, because guys and Eve have been doing events as storytellers and stuff like that. Um, but first, I just want to let everybody know uh, before you join, we, we use the V20 system. Um, at first, some people may seem, it may seem to some people that it's, you know, uh, pretty complex, but really it's not. We have people always on, ready to help people learn it. And I, in my opinion, you should learn it because, as I said in the previous podcast, they are looking to use the V20 system as uh, the V20 is Vampire the Masquerade uh, version 20. Um, they want to use that system uh, for a base for their game. So, uh, so everybody's thinking that they're going to be using the character sheet and everything like that for the game itself. So you should learn it uh, and stuff like that. Uh, so guys, go ahead. Tell us uh, what you've been doing and what kind of events you've been you know, planning or have done in the past. All right. Well, I've run, well, I've run one event, ran one event, rather, um, in October for Halloween. And I'm currently running a December event, which obviously has run a little bit longer than December. Uh, I can't really tell you much about the December event because chaos is in it and spoilers. But I will mention that both of them do take ideas from Requiem, from the New World of Darkness. And while some of you might start screaming sacrilege, there is good ideas, at least in my opinion, that are in the New World of Darkness lore-wise. Uh, specifically the Mortal line, because the Mortal line has put Mortal up against stuff that is not seen in the Old World of Darkness. And that's a good segue into the first event, which is the Halloween event, which I basically took the Jersey Devil from World of Darkness, New World of Darkness, rather, Urban Legends, and I basically sent six or seven vampires into the woods and told them to f find this thing, and they ended up fighting it. Uh, it was a very fun event. Um, I had to beef up the devil, obviously, because you can't really take a mortal line monster um, that you're supposed to go up against with a 200 and a shotgun against a numerous kindred. So I beefed him up, uh, gave him some vampire, uh, not vampire, gargoyle powers a little bit. Didn't make him a gargoyle, just stole the powers. And I put him up against it. And it turned out very well. Uh, as an ST, I got to kick people into trees and impale them on stuff and kill people. It was fun. None of the players died. I killed NPCs. Uh, it was very enjoyable, and I feel like I'm just talking in circles. So I should sort of move on to the second event. I'll tell you a little bit about that, just to give you an idea. It's based on Midnight Roads. Uh, specifically, actually it's not based on Midnight Roads. I took the Gremlins from Midnight Road, which are given, like, a very small passage in, I think it's the third chapter of New World of Darkness, Midnight Road, and took them and put them in the setting from the World of Darkness Asylum book, the New World of Darkness Asylum book. So basically I have, I believe it's five kindred and a mortal wandering around an asylum, an abandoned asylum, um, that is now infested with these gremlins that are going around, quote-unquote, fixing things, which tied into a larger plot that I can't reveal because chaos is here. But if you guys are interested in hearing more about the events we run and the stories that are happening on our site, 
we might recap them in future podcasts or future videos. So just tell us what you want, and we'll get it to you. All right, now, Eve? Uh, sorry, Eve, before you go, I just want to fix one thing that I said before, which was I said the V20 was the Vampire the Masquerade uh, version 20. I meant I meant uh, anniver 20th anniversary edition, not 20th version. Obviously, there's not, there's not 20 versions of it. But uh, anyway, <laughs> Eve, go ahead. Um, I held an event for Christmas, which was a party that I had for my... Uh, people in Lust who choose to go into Lust sect. I had previously beforehand done a poll on the site for anybody who wanted to voice their opinion of what they wanted next for a real-time story-driven thread, and most people voted murder mysteries, so I decided to incorporate that into my event, and I think a lot of people had fun, and it was mostly social with some nice, you know, investigative detective work. Very cool. And Kay, what what have you been doing, uh, RP wise or or out of character wise within the guild? Well, um, I, like I said earlier, I'm in one of his events. Uh, that's going interestingly well um, with the gremlins and things, trying to fix everything. And um, what else? Um, I have. We've gotten a little group also started for um, a Call of Cthulhu, but that's not really important. We're just playing around with that right now. And, um, yeah, that's about it so far. Um, that's the biggest thing I've done was the, the event. Oh, and wait, one other thing. Um, I'm also in a, another thread with uh, Elgin running the the thread and um, I, I've seemed to lost all my blood. I don't know what happened there, but we'll figure that out when it comes. I, uh, <laughs> I am the person that's actually putting together the Call of Cthulhu uh, game. First time ever running with the basic roleplay system, and I enjoy it, but that's not why you're here. And Chaos, I know why all your blood's gone, and I really want to tell you, but I'm not going to. Yeah, that thanks. sounds interesting. <laughs> that sounds interesting. Um, so, if anybody want to talk about anything else they've been doing in the guild, uh, just you know, give people an idea of what we kind of do uh, within uh, uh, RP or RP wise. Yeah. So, if you guys have anything else, let me know. Not RP wise, but I do have another comment. But I'll reserve that unless the other guys don't have anything to say. No, I don't have anything. I'm good here. All right. Well, I notice a lot because I go through the YouTube videos from time to time, our YouTube videos, and I notice a lot of people. Yeah, I want to join. I would like to join. Blah blah blah. Join. We. If you join, even if you have no idea what you're doing, we will tell you. We will show you whatever you want. We'll tell you how to play. We'll do whatever we need to. But we, I just want to send that invitation out there. If you want to join, join. We are. I might have said this before. We are mostly. A American North American branch. We do things in English predominantly, actually completely. But we've had, as I said earlier, we had a commenter from France who wanted to join. We have people. We do have European members. Uh, we have lots of European, well, a good amount of European members. And welcome, all of you. Welcome. All right. So with that done, we're kind of closing the podcast here. And as always, we have shout outs to the people that have recently joined the guild. And I'll do those really quick. So we have Almely, we have Anya, we have Faye, Ingvar, Pool, and Skytus. Those are really great members, and they've all been very active, actually, which is great. And uh, we're very happy to have them. And uh, with that, I will uh, just uh, I'll say one thing, and then we'll go into our goodbyes. And that one thing would be is I'm sorry that uh, that. Uh, I haven't put out the instructional video for uh, V20 character sheets, and I will be doing that soon. I just have to fix our wiki because I am in the process of uh, making a wiki to instruct people on how to make character sheets and how the game is run. So once that's all complete, I'll be able to fully put out a video with all of our information because we still have a, we have a few house rules. Um, that need to be discussed and, and stuff like that. So I'll say my goodbyes now. So goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Thanks for listening. Nice.
talking. Uh, thanks for having me, and goodbye. If you guys are listening to this right now, we are recording this section after the main podcast. So for this short time, it's just going to be Guy and myself talking about um, just one thing that happened after we actually recorded the podcast, um, which is pretty interesting, and I'll get to it. So anyway, you guys may may or may not have uh, heard about the recent comment uh, that Chris McDonough put on Facebook. Well, uh, the story goes that an argument raged, raged on Facebook uh, whether World of Darkness is going to show anything at the uh, next Eve Fan Fest. Long story short, Chris came in and stated, uh, quote, Showing or not showing anything at FanFest is not an indicator of anything. First off, it is EVE FanFest. Every year we debate about showing anything because WAD is not EVE related. Smiley. The choice about whether we show anything at FanFest are complicated for many reasons. Either way, the game is looking great at the moment and we continue to, to do internal testings whether we show anything or not. I'm glad you guys are still hanging in there. Thanks for being great fans. Uh, so, I mean, I appreciate him. I appreciate him, you know, stating the game is still in production. But I, but by his statement, it, you know, it, it doesn't. It doesn't really. It, it, it seems a little forced to me. I don't know about you, uh, guy, but it seems a little forced to me. And I really think, you know, the, the fans are starving for information. I mean, even for us who want to, you know, put out bi-monthly podcasts, we can't because, you know, they're giving, us, they're giving us no information to work with. I mean, what was it, like three months before we could even put up this one because um, we had no information. I mean, it was just interviews, a few interviews um, and whatever, you know, whatever we said in the podcast. Um, but uh, judging by the uncertainty of the post that he made, I truly feel like they will, they will be putting something up in, uh, in at FanFest. I mean, it's the only place they can really put it up um, and release any type of information. And I mean, because it is a CCP, you know, project. So, guy, what do you what do you have to think about it? Um, the, I mean, the question is whether or not they should show anything at a fan test, which I would say yes, uh, especially since there is no longer a Grand Masquerade, or there hasn't been one for a few years. So there really is no World of Darkness White Wolf place anymore. And you got to put it somewhere. But even if they don't, I can kind of see why. Because there are all alternatives to where they could put it up. There's the Electronic Entertainment Expo, E3, that they could put to get the game. There's, if you want to go from the direct to the tabletop community, you can have Dragon Con, Gen Con, etc. There's the Nordic uh, Game Convention, which is Swedish in Scandinavia. There's Eurogamer. There's, I don't know if they do the one uh, convention in Japan, but they probably wouldn't. Or they might. But there's a lot of places they could do it other than EFANFEST. It just doesn't seem like a good idea to just say, we're not doing it at EFANFEST. In terms... Oh, I'm sorry. In terms of whether it being forced or not, it's... I mean... The man's professional. He's in this company for a reason. He's been doing this for a long time, as far as I'm aware of. And so he's writing. It's very professionally written, but it doesn't seem forced to me much at all. It just seems... It actually, it shows, if anything, that the guys that are working on the game, or are part of CCP or at whatever level, are looking and they are listening to what's going on in, on social media and stuff like that. And they sort of understand. Because it would have been much easier to say, let these guys just <laughs> debate and fight it out on Facebook, rather than comment and rather than make little ripples, say, hey, we, we're thinking about it and we're, we're doing stuff. It doesn't. So, I thought it was nice. I don't think it was forced at all. I thought it was actually a very clever move. Well, by forced, I mean it seemed like he wanted to get the point across. Like, you know, guys, we're not gonna, we're not gonna tell you if we're putting anything out or if we are putting anything out. So, you know, be quiet for the time being. That's what it, that's what it sounded like to me. I don't know if it sounds like that to you. It didn't. Um, I really should have wrote this down before the podcast. But I'm trying to think of when the next fan fest is. Um, 
because that would sort of, it, depending on how far away it is, that, that debate, that internal debate has to be going on if what he says is true, that whether or not to put something out. I mean, I think the game was announced in, what, 2010 at the Grand Masquerade? So it's been, it's going on four years of, of like, minimal information. Um, and we're looking at two or three more. It'd be nice to get something. Because um, I remember we did that. I'm saying um a lot. I just realized that. But we we did that podcast, which is what happened at the last event fest, which was that video, which we couldn't put up, but we described. So I'm like, just give us more of that. Just if you figure that's the smallest amount of information, we'll fight over it for months. <laughs> yeah, seriously. I mean. Give us a little bit of information, and we're good for a few months. <laughs> I mean, even if it's the smallest tidbit, uh, maybe a clip or something. Just, you know, something easily done. <laughs> That'd be great. Um, but anyway, uh, to the people watching, if uh, you guys want to see, well, I know everybody wants to see it at FanFest, but uh, what would you like to see at this FanFest? If, if they do put it up, what would you like to see? Uh, put it in the comments below if you... Uh, well, tell me what you guys want to see. Um, so, Guy, do you have anything else to say? Oh, sorry, good. I was gonna, I was gonna say, and if we remember that you said that, which hopefully we will, we all will comment on it in the next podcast or whenever we put up another video.